For Creamer Media's Policy, I'm Sashni Madhi. Joining me today are journalists Jonathan Anser and Chris Whitfield, here to discuss their book, Joining the Dots, an unauthorized biography of Praveen Gordon. There's not much in the public domain about Praveen Gordon's past, but you both managed to interview him for your book. Can you briefly give our viewers some insights into his family origins, life growing up in apartheid South Africa, and how he became an activist? Uh, Your book suggests it wasn't a single moment that pushed him into it. Yes, so he was born in 1949. His parents had come from India uh, to South Africa. They weren't wealthy. Uh, his father ran a sari shop selling the saris. Um, and, he, and he grew up in central Durban in the Bay Street area. From a very humble background, that they weren't rich. His father's shop went bankrupt. He grew up very modestly. He, he, his family weren't political at all. He described himself as the black sheep of the family when he when because he started becoming political. And there were a couple of incidents that happened, and most notably when he went to university and he started getting involved in politics. Um, and, and that was the series of events uh, at university where he started to form an identity as an activist rather than a politician. And that was in the early 70s. Um, late late sixties that he that he went to university studied pharmacy, but it was really a struggle against the university management, and um, and that was quite linked to the broader struggle against the country at the time the the, the apartheid laws. And while he did study pharmacy, his job as a pharmacist at King Edward Hospital in Ambilo served as a cover for much of his political work. Can you just tell us a bit about that time? He was ostensibly a, a pharmacist. He, he, he worked as a pharmacist. He was employed by the King Edward Hospital. While he was there, he was hosting meetings. He was meeting with people, notably uh, Jacob Zuma, but also Mac Maharaj. People were coming off the island, Robben Island at the time, the, the first sort of lot of prisoners that were coming off that had been arrested in the, in the, and sentenced in the, in the 60s. He was a pharmacist. He, it was a legitimate job. But he had uh, a number of jobs. He, he was a community activist at that time, where he was uh, working to uh, improve the lives of, of people in, in townships in, in KZN. And um, he, he was also working in the underground and he was working in, uh, you know, legal organizations. Being at, at King Redwood Street Hospital was actually a very good cover for him. It was a convenient place to, to meet with people. When he was in detention, I think for his first or second stint in detention, while he was in detention, he was fired. The reasons were obviously because he was political and he was an activist. They sort of trumped up some, some reasons, the, the government, the, the, the authorities trumped up reasons to fire him. He had many, many different roles in the struggle. One of them was as a, as a pharmacist. And though your book says, you know, while he wasn't the most obvious choice to head up SARS, he was an inspired choice. I mean, he turned around the revenue service with many international entities praising the institution under his stewardship. So how did he go about this task? I mean, I think he was the first a black person to head up SARS. Yes, I, when he entered SARS, uh, he entered as a deputy commissioner. I think that was in, uh, was that 1998? And then 1999, he was appointed commissioner. Um, but when he entered, I think there were very, very few black people in the organization at all. So he had a double role. The first role was to sort of transform the organization, um, which which he did with absolute smoothness and ease. And then the second role was to make the organization very, very efficient, from being very inefficient to very in- efficient. And he, he had a number of strategies to do that. And the one way that he did that was to actually encourage people to pay taxes. And he did that with the message that paying taxes is a patriotic duty. It's going to rebuild this country. And many people believed in that. And and SARS was very, very successful. He ran it like an activist organization, um, which which obviously wasn't always the right thing to do. But at that time, he, he... encouraged people to pay taxes, you could show where the, where their tax money was going. It was going into building houses, into building clinics, into building schools. And people for the first time felt, well, actually, this was a good thing to do. So he really streamlined the organization. He also got the, you know, very, very good people into strategic positions. 
He uh, make, made sure he didn't alienate people who were already in the organization. It was clear that this was a different type of SARS. This was a SARS for the, that was going to rebuild this country. And his second stint as finance minister under former President Jacob Zuma, it wasn't smooth sailing with the role of the Zuma-Gupta relationship exposed. And his health suffered as a result, but he was so determined to stick it out. Even his wife feared that he would be killed in 2016. And he's been accused of so much that you detail in the book that has since been proven to be false. So why did he insist on sticking it out under Zuma? I think a not smooth sailing is probably a, a very good euphemism, but but it was really, really rough for him. I mean, as soon as he was appointed, and you'll re- remember that he was appointed that weekend after uh, Des van Royen had, had had the keys to, to the treasury, and the, the bottom had fallen out of, of, of the country, really. And he felt, again, that it was, that, you know, he's an activist, um, he felt that he had to do it. But the moment he took over as, or retook over the position as finance minister, it was war. It was full blown war between him and the, the you know, Zuma and Zuma's um, kind of allies. But he stood it out because for him, the national interest trumps everything. The research that we did, the people that we spoke to, that was a clear, clear theme that that came out. You know, Pravin Gordon is not interested in anything that will benefit Pravin. He's interested in, in things that will benefit the country. And I think that's something that has been lost about Pravin over the years. So he stood up to state capture, the forces of state capture, often just a lone voice in cabinet. He did have support, but it was difficult. It was a very, very difficult time. And um, he had m- made some very powerful enemies, but um, he stood up to it because of, you know, he believed in the national interest. I think uh, actually that, that's the one characteristic that is like a thread through the whole book, how he is completely and utterly devoted to activism. And it's a selfless uh, devotion. It's a, it's a, commitment to the country and to the people. And it's, we actually found that aspect of it quite remarkable, right from his activism days and the work he did in KZN and places like Tin Town and Phoenix, right through to being a cabinet minister, right to this current day, where a lot of people ask him, a lot of people say, why haven't you just moved on? And he's, he's, you know, he's well past retirement age and he's just carrying on. And you spoke to a number of people about the relationship between Zuma and Godan and you know, they worked closely in the anti-apartheid struggle in the 70s. They even share a birthday, but they took very different parts uh, when it comes to integrity. Do you have any idea how Godan feels about the breakdown in his relationship with Zuma? Well, he's not very warm to, about Zuma now. He, he called him, you know, he was a little bit, he used some fairly derogatory phrases about him, called him Mr. Charming, sarcastically, obviously. I think if you interrogate their, their history, their early days together, they were certainly allies and they probably had respect for one another in terms of the fact that they were both involved in the struggle. Praveen Gordon is a, a, a man of integrity and it turns out that Jacob Zuma wasn't. So their paths diverged and Praveen Gordon stood on a point of principle against Jacob Zuma. So they're not, they really don't like each other now. Gordon argues that under President Sir Ramaphosa, the country is beginning to repair the damage done during the state capture years. I mean, with SAA on the mend uh, and signs of restoration of electricity security being given priority, are we actually seeing signs that South Africa is turning the corner from state capture? Sure, it's a very difficult question to answer because there's the balance of power within government is so delicate, within the ANC effectively, is so delicate that, you know, if you look down the the road we can there's there's two paths we can follow and one is that the what you might want to call the good guys win and then the other is that the bad guys win so it's it's difficult to answer that categorically but what i do think is that the general sort of pessimism about the the country and the route that's been taken under sort of ramaphosa has been a bit misplaced i do think there's been more going on if you get down into the nitty-gritty uh, than people uh, are, are, are often willing to acknowledge. And Jonathan, in your introduction, you write that Praveen Godan doesn't see himself as a politician. I mean, your book detailed his massive role in the resistance against apartheid, and we won't go into detail about that here. 
because I think people have to read the book to understand how significant his contribution actually was. But with all of his experience in politics, why doesn't he see himself as a politician specifically? I think he sees himself as first and foremost as an activist. He still does, even though he's been in the government, he's been a cabinet minister, or he still is a cabinet minister. He sees himself as serving the people, not as a, as a politician, but as an activist. That's what drives him. He comes from a background in the UDF, um, where he was mobilizing communities, encouraging people to, to, to stand up and, and resist and I think that's that's always how he's seen himself. When we talk to him about, well, you know, when eventually you do retire, what will you do? And again, it's it's well, I'll, con- you know, once you be an activist, you you don't stop being an activist. That's how he sees himself. You've both spoken with him. What was your overall impression of him? What is he like? I think he's a very decent human being, and as as we've said, he's uh, has absolutely impeccable integrity, but he doesn't suffer fools. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to cross him. I wouldn't like to get on the wrong side of him. Fundamentally, a very, very good and committed and decent human being. But um, I do think he's tough. You know, you can't do that, be in that game for so long without beginning being tough. And he, he is tough. And I, don't, and I wouldn't like to work for him and not do a good job, for example. Everybody who worked for him says that they were like very, very committed. They would prepare for meetings, et cetera, because they were scared of getting on the wrong side of him. He gave us a lot of time uh, when we interviewed him. He was very generous about that. And this was over and above. You know, we would have, uh, it would be on a Sunday afternoon and he had already been to two meetings. And then after our interview, he was going off to another meeting. Um, but But he always, you know, made time for us. And also, you know, he never, ever controlled anything that we asked. You know, if we asked a question, he would think about it and he would answer it. He never refused to answer any questions. And he never told us who to interview or who not to interview. You are investigating somebody um, and you are doing research. And many times they want to come out looking as, you know, rosy as possible. But he never imposed any sort of restrictions on us or controlled the interview in any way at all. And I, I think that also speaks a lot to, to his personality. That was journalists Jonathan Anser and Chris Whitfield discussing their book, Joining the Dots, an unauthorized biography of Praveen Gordon.